Hello everyone. Today we'll find out what exactly happened to Tommy when she ran off to look for oranges. Let's get started. Chapter 14 In the Pit When Tommy left the hut, she ran with all the fleetness of her young legs up towards the ridge. All the way she said to herself, I won't be afraid, I won't, I won't. Keeping up her courage also with the thought of the surprise she would give her sisters when she returned laden with fruit. The morning was somewhat misty, but the mist was not so thick as to hide the general features of the country. As before, she followed the course of the stream, and when she came to the swamp, she turned to the right and continued as nearly as possible in a straight line with the crest. Arriving at the top, she stopped for a few moments rather puzzled. The appearance of the country was unfamiliar. The spot she had reached was certainly not the place to which she, with her sisters, had come on the former excursion. It was clear that she had wandered somewhere from the proper route. She went on, the very difficulty in which she found herself helping to strengthen her determination. There were trees on all sides, but for some time she discovered none that were bearing oranges. At length, however, as the mist lifted, she perceived some golden spots among the foliage and ran towards them. She hoped that this was not the orange grove in which she had been so much frightened and the return of her nervousness made her quicken her pace and gather, in a kind of frantic haste, a number of oranges that be spattered the ground. In order to turn her journey to the utmost advantage, she meant to fill her pocket with oranges and take as many as possible in her hands as well. But remembering that her pocket was usually full of all sorts of odds and ends, she knelt down to empty it and throw away what was useless so as to have more room for the oranges. She had just laid on the ground her knife in a few oddments when Throwing in spite of herself a nervous glance around, she noticed a slight movement in the bushes on her right, the direction in which she had come. She could not help looking again, and then she sprang to her feet transfixed with terror. There was the same little brown face peering out from among the background of foliage. For a few seconds, the two pairs of eyes remained staring at each other, then, scarcely knowing what she did, but in an instinctive moment of defense, Tommy waved her hands towards the bush. The face instantly disappeared, but Tommy in her agitation forgot her errand, forgot the thing she had placed beside her and took to her heels, sighing in a blind panic from the spot. She did not even stay to make sure she was going in the right direction, she had quite lost command of herself, and regardless of thorns and creepers that tore her skirts and tripped her steps, she plunged through the undergrowth. Every sound seemed to her excited imagination to be made by pursuers following upon her track. Suddenly, the earth gave way beneath her. She felt herself sinking, sinking. Bass! Bass! She screamed. And then she knew no more. When she regained consciousness, she found herself in semi-darkness. For a moment, she was simply bewildered. She was half smothered with twigs, leaves and earth. Then she remembered all that had happened and sprang to her feet. But an excruciating pain in her left ankle caused her to fall back and the agony was so intense that she remained for some time in a half-fainting condition. Presently, she recovered. A second attempt to rise gave her such a twinge that she knew her ankle was seriously sprained. The move without help was impossible. Her fear of the little brown face was overcome by a still greater anxiety. Where was she? She looked about her. Some distance above her head, considerably higher than the rooms at the farm, was a wide opening. She must have fallen into a pit. But it seemed to her a strange pit, her eyes becoming accustomed to her dimness. She saw that the floor upon which she lay was much broader than the opening at the top. An insect touching her hand made her jump, and with a feeling of horror, she wondered if the pit was infested with noxious creatures that would sting her to death. She shouted frantically again and again, but her voice only seemed to be thrown back at her, and when she remembered how far off her sisters were, she realized that her cries, if they were heard above, could only bring the savages from which she had fled. For a time she cowered among the trash, overwhelmed with despair. Then, when she was calm enough to think, it was only to recognize more fully the seriousness of her plight. Her sisters could never guess what had become of her. If they took alarm at her essence and Elizabeth came in search of her, it was quite likely that she would never discover the spot. Perhaps even she might be captured by the natives. For the sight of the little brown face had convinced Tommy that beyond the ridge, the island was overrun with cannibals. There was nothing to her that they had never appeared on her side of the island, she told herself, that they had simply waited until they could catch one girl alone. 
Nor did it seem to her ridiculous that a tribe of bloodthirsty savages should be so timorous as to refrain from openly attacking three defenseless girls. The dreadful thought occurred to her, Am I to die in this prison? The prospect of such a fate made her shiver. She felt that even to fall into the hands of cannonballs was preferable to a lingering death in this pit, and again she raised her voice in wild cries for help, repeating them until she was exhausted. For some time she remained in a state of stupor, but when she was able to collect herself, she wondered whether, in spite of her injured foot, she could, by any exertion of her own, escape. She crept on hands and knees to the side of the pit, but even if she had been able to use her foot, she saw that she could never climb up those sloping walls. Glancing round, however, she saw that in the wall to her right there was an opening yawning black. She crawled to it and peered in. It was so dark that she could see nothing beyond the yard, but she felt a faint hope that it might be a passage leading somehow to the level ground. Recollecting her automatic matchbox, which fortunately had attached to her belt, she threw a small flickering light on the scene. She saw now that she was indeed at the entrance of a tunnel. It could not be a short one if it led to the outer air, for there was no glimmer of light from its black depth. But it was worth trying, so the light, as far as it was, giving her a sense of security, began to creep slowly along the dark passage, every now and again wincing as a pain shot through. It was a strange tunnel, not rounded and of regular shape like the railway tunnels at home, but varying in width and height. In some places, the roof was beyond the range of Tommy's feeble light. At others, it came so low that she could not have stood upright. The floor was uneven, the walls were rugged, a recess here, a protuberance here. Clearly, it had not been cut by the hands of men, but must be attributed to a freak of nature. To Tommy, crawling inch by inch along the ground, it seemed that the tunnel would never end. How long it was, how many minutes or hours this painful progress continued, she was quite unable to guess. At last, with a cry of gladness, she saw a faint gleam of light beyond and tried to advance more quickly, so as to gain liberty and fresh air. The light came in through an aperture in the wall that appeared to be the end of the passage. It was high above ground, and Tommy, standing on one foot, was just able to look through it. She thought that if she could only manage to heave herself up to it, the aperture was just wide enough to let her body through. But first of all, she must make sure it led to safety. It was not full daylight outside. Beyond the wall, there appeared to be not open space, but another confined chamber. Supposing she climbed up and got through, how far would she have to drop to reach the ground on the other side? And what if she should find herself only another place from which escape would be no easier than from the pit? To stand on one foot was fatiguing, and Tommy had to sit down and rest for a while. She had now recovered from panic and was ready to bend all her young wits upon the problem of escape. Presently, a means occurred to her discovering at least whether it would be safe for her to make an attempt to clamber through the aperture. She fell along the floor for a piece of rock, and standing up again, dropped it over the ledge. In an instant, there came a faint thud, and immediately came afterwards came a great whirring and screaming. She was quick to infer that the ground was at some depth below the opening, and that the falling rock had disturbed a colony of birds of some kind. Can I be at the top of a cliff? she thought. Plainly, it was impossible to escape in this direction. The dashing of her heart almost made Tommy weep. She had done no good, indeed had only wasted time. There was nothing for it but to crawl back to the pit, and as she wearily crept through the passage, despair seized upon her heart. She felt the choking sensation of helpless misery. Her terror was even deepened when on getting back to the pit, she found that it was now quite dark. Through the opening, she could see the stars overhead. But there was no pleasure in watching them as she had many times watched them from the hut. She crouched upon the leaves, scarcely able to bear the throbbing pain in her foot, and when presently she fell asleep from sheer exhaustion, it was with a prayer on her lips, God help me, and let me see my sisters again. Pain and thirst awakened her several times before dawn. A slight shower fell during the night, and by catching the raindrops in her outspread palm, she was able to moisten her parched lips. She also wetted her handkerchief and bound it about her inflamed ankle, thus easing the pain a little. When it was quite light overhead, she began to shout again, her voice sounding very cracked and hoarse. Soon she had to give up even this. Her tongue and the roof of her mouth were so dry that she could not utter a word. Then she lost all hope, and lying down sobbed herself to sleep. When she awoke, it was again dark. 
Her food was much less painful, but she felt more hungry and thirsty than ever before in her life. If only she had filled her pocket with oranges before she saw that little brown face. Again, the idea came to her of attempting to climb the side of the pit by cutting steps in the earth. But on feeling her pocket, she remembered that she had dropped her knife on the ground. Hobbling across a pit, she felt along the walls, only to find, as before, that their slope made it quite impossible to clamber up. And feeling that starvation must be her doom, she sank back and lay in a state of dreamy somnolence. All at once, she was startled into wakefulness by a faint sound somewhere above her. She sprang up. Sunlight was streaming through the opening. The sound came again. It was someone calling. Tommy tried to shout in answer, but the feeble croak was all she could utter dismayed her. With help at hand, she might not be heard. The call above was now quite clear. It was coming nearer. She heard her own name. But the more she tried to call, the less she seemed able to make a sound. The voice above began to recede. Then with a last desperate effort, she did manage to produce a hoarse cry that she could scarcely believe came from her own throat. So strange it was. It seemed to have used up all the little strength she had left and she fell exhausted to the ground, believing that the last chance of rescue had utterly vanished. Chapter 15 The Eleven Hour Some little time after Elizabeth had left her, Mary fancied that she caught a faint cry. She sounded to her sister, who was out of sight, but whose voice she heard calling at intervals. The feeble sound seemed to have come from a patch of woodland not a great distance from the track which Elizabeth had taken. But as the wind was blowing from that quarter, Mary realized that although she could hear Elizabeth, it was probably impossible for Elizabeth to hear her. She felt very tired after her long walk, and doubted whether she could go far without her sister's sustaining arm. But the thought that Elizabeth might wander out of reach while Tommy was in danger near at hand gave her an artificial strength. She rose from the ground and tottered in the direction from which a cry had appeared to come. Every now and then she stopped, listening for a repetition of the sound, but she heard nothing except the rustle of the wind and Elizabeth's shouts, growing fainter and fainter in the distance. In a few moments she had passed beyond the orange grove and felt that she was in danger of losing her way. Even Elizabeth's voice soon ceased to guide her. She stumbled along, shouting every few steps with no other result than to disturb the birds in the trees. Becoming alarmed at the possibility of being lost and her strength failing, she was on the point of trying to find her way back and gave one last call when she was electrified by hearing a strange hoarse sound, apparently coming from some distance to the left. It was little like a human voice, yet it was not the cry of a bird, and Mary hurried with uneven steps towards it. The ground rose steeply, leading up to the ridge far to the left, but with a new strength lent by excitement, Mary was not conscious of the slope. She came to a number of straggling bushes edged by an irregular circle of small trees. Here she looked eagerly around her, peering through the bushes and between the trunks of the trees, listening for that strange cry to be repeated. There was no sound, but as her eyes travelled over the circuit, she noticed what seemed to be a small landslip in the bank. Following this downward, her glance discovered a hole in the ground several feet wide, moved by a sudden impulse, and the instinctive feeling that here was the explanation of Tommy's disappearance. She stumbled forward, hardly conscious of her trembling limbs. Throwing herself flat on the ground at the edge of the hole, she gazed into the pit beneath. It was some moments before her eyes became used to the half-light, but then she saw something white. She distinguished it as part of an object huddled on the ground immediately beneath the opening and she knew that Tommy was found. But an agonizing fear seized her. Was Tommy dead? She called down in a low voice. There was no answer. She called again and still again, her tones growing louder as she became more alarmed. At length, after what seemed an age of suspense, a strained gaze noticed a slight movement in the figure below, and a faint whisper come up to her. Thank God! Her heart cried out, and she eagerly called to Tommy saying that she would soon be safe, but Tommy made no reply, yet relapsed into unconsciousness. Mary was at her wit's end what to do. It was clear that Tommy was helpless. A pang shot through Mary's heart as she remembered that the girl had been without food for two days and two nights. The hole was so deep that even if Tommy had been conscious, Mary could not have helped her at the utmost stretch of her arms to get out. Elizabeth was beyond hearing. She might return to the orange grove, what would she do if she found Mary missing? Mary dared not leave the neighborhood of the pit now that Tommy was found. 
but she wanted to run after Elizabeth and bring her to the spot. While she was still undecided, she heard Elizabeth's voice in the far distance. She shouted in reply, though she still felt that against her wind, her voice could not be heard. But in a few moments, she was gladdened to know from the growing loudness of the shouts that Elizabeth was returning. There was a chance that she, as she drew nearer, she would hear a shrill call. So Mary, every few moments, formed a trumpet with her hands and let forth a prolonged call. Wee! Presently, she knew by the tone of Elizabeth's call that her voice had been heard. But so confusing as sounds that made woods and thickets, it was a long time before Elizabeth discovered where she was. Hurrying through the Have you found her? she asked eagerly. She is down there, replied Mary, pointing to the mouth of a pit. Oh, Bess, I'm afraid she is very much hurt, perhaps dying. Elizabeth, with an exclamation of dismay, threw herself down and peered into a hole. Tommy, Tommy, dear, she called. But there was no answer. Elizabeth measured with her eye the depth of the pit. She felt tempted to spring down and see if Tommy were alive or dead. Will you stay here while I run back and get the painter? she asked. At the moment, neither of the girls thought of savages. Fear for Tommy had banished every other fear. It will take so long, murmured Mary. You will be gone an hour at least and... I know a way, Elizabeth interrupted. We'll make a rope of creepers. It won't take us long. She darted off into the forest. In building the hut, she had become an expert in selecting strong tendrils while binding their lattice work. And in a few moments, she had cut from the dense undergrowth a considerable quantity of tough material with which she hurried back to the pit. The two girls at once set to work with nimble fingers, plating the tendrils together. We must be famished and dead with thirst, said Mary. If only we could give her some water. There's a little brook not far away, said Elizabeth. When we are done the road, we'll make a cup of leaves and I'll fetch some water. Then you must let me down into the pit. I could never do it, said Mary. I'm not strong enough. Stop by yourself. Well, I'll fasten one end of the rope to that tree you see there. Then we'll pass it round that little one near us. And you'll be strong enough to pay it out. That's the only way. They worked very quickly and finished a long stout rope in little more time than the journey home would have taken. While Mary made several cuts from the large spreading leaves of a plant like rhubarb, Elizabeth wound one end of the rope tightly about the tree trunk she had pointed out. In the other end, she made a loop to cling to. The rope is not long enough, said Mary. Not to reach a bottom, but it doesn't matter. I can drop a few feet. When you have let me down, run down that slope, Mary, and you'll find the brook a little way to the right. Bring two of the leaves filled with water and let them down by the rope. Here's a hole in each side of the cup near the top and pass the rope through. You'll see how to do it. Now take the rope firmly, I'll slip over the edge, and when I give the word, let it run out gently around the tree. Pale with anxiety and weakness, Mary took up her position in the tree. She made a determined effort to obey Elizabeth's instructions. Inch by inch, the rope slipped through her hands, at last so fast that she held her breath in terror lest Elizabeth should be dashed to the ground. The rope was stretched to its extreme tension, then it suddenly relaxed, and next moment she heard the welcome cry from the pit. I'm safe! Now for the water! Gathering herself together, Mary sped off to the brook, carrying the two leaf cups, eagerness to help lend her strength. She returned with them brimming, drew up the rope and unfastened the loop at the end. Then, passing two of the strands through the holes made in the cup, she let it down slowly into the pit. Some of the water was spilled in the decent, but Elizabeth said that was enough was left for a moment. How is she? asked Mary, dreading to hear that Tommy was past help. She is unconscious but breathing, said Elizabeth. I'll give her some water. For some little time, Mary heard no more. Elizabeth bathed Tommy's head and moistened her lips. At length, the young girl gave a long sigh and moan. I'm here, dear, said Elizabeth gently. Mary's above. Just say now. The face, moaned Tommy, her mind leaping back over all that had happened since she had seen those eyes staring at her. Hush, said Elizabeth, stroking her head. There is nothing to harm you. Drink a little water. We must see about getting you out of this pit, you know. Tommy drank eagerly, holding Elizabeth's hands in a tight clasp. We're getting on famously, Elizabeth called to reassure Mary. Tommy lay still, taking a sip of water every now and again, too weak to move or to speak. Meanwhile, Elizabeth was beating her brain for some means of getting her to the surface. It was clear that Tommy for some time would be unable to do anything for herself. Lightly built though she was, her dead weight was far more than Elizabeth could hope to sustain, hanging onto the rope. No one but Mary to exist from above. The rope was too short by several feet. 
the first necessity was to lengthen it. Personally, therefore, when Tommy was more recovered, Elizabeth asked Mary to cut some more creepers and throw them down. Now her practice in splicing on board her uncle's ship was very useful. He quickly added three or four feet to the rope's length. Tommy, dear, I'm going to leave you for a little, she The coin's safe now. I'm going to arrange about lifting you out of this horrid place. You must be hungry, poor thing. I'll get a few oranges. You can reach them, we throw them down, can you? And bananas too, they're more substantial. By the time I'm ready to leave you, you'll be heaps stronger. Mary won't go, said Tommy quiveringly. No, she'll stay with you. You can hear her when she speaks to you. But don't try to talk yourself, just eat the fruit I shall give you and get strong. He then told Mary to come to the edge of a pit and be ready to help her. But take care you don't overbalance, she said. It mustn't be a case of three girls in a pit. Feared as Elizabeth had. The joy of discovering Tommy alive had braced her, and she felt equal to any exertion. But she had not had Tommy's practicing tree climbing nor in clambering up the rigging on the bike. And when she clasped the rope and tried to draw herself up, she slipped down again and again. For a time she felt baffled, but the means of overcoming difficulty occurred to her. Pull up the rope, Mary, she said, and make knots in it about two feet apart. I shall be able to manage it then, I think. When the knots were made, she tried again. It was a terrible strain on her wrist. She got no assistance for her feet from the shelving sides of the pit, but the knots gave a firm hold and she managed to climb hand over hand to the edge where with Mary's help she heaved herself onto the level ground Still rest, said Mary, noticing the signs of strain on her sister's face I'm not a bit tired Look Mary, I want you to play another rope, I'll get the stuff for you She hastened into the undergrowth and returned with her arms full of creepers Now I'm going to get Tommy some food and then run back to the hut I'll be as quick as I can Talk to her while I am away to keep her spirits up Soon she was flinging an armful of bananas and oranges one by one into the pit. There's a feast for you, she said cheerfully. Now in about an hour you'll be released. Eat slowly, that's the rule after fasting, isn't it? You are a dear, said Mary, hugging her. What should we have done without you? My dear girl, without me you wouldn't have been here at all. We all came together. Goodbye for an hour. She flitted off as lightly as a bird, overflowing with happiness. Reaching the hut, she took up the longest of the mat beds, her own, and without waiting for a moment to rest, hurried back to her sister, announcing herself from a distance by cheerful cooey. Oh well, she said. Tommy has been telling me all about it, said Mary. She saw the little brown face again. What a little brown face, said Elizabeth. Really, I should like to smack it. Tommy is well enough to talk, is she? Yes, but she has sprained her ankle. Poor girl, it'll be hip the hop when we get her up then. Now see how we'll manage it. You finish the rope, we'll make a cradle of my bed. She made two holes at each end of the mat large enough for the rope to pass through. In this way, she formed a rough cradle upon which Tommy could be drawn up, or the girl's weight would keep it steady if the ropes were placed far enough apart. The cradle was soon ready for lowering. Do you mind to get on it yourself, Tommy? asked Elizabeth, or shall I come down again and help you? I can't manage, answered Tommy. I'm ever so much better. Are you sure it's strong enough? Certain. I trust myself on it. All you'll have to do is to clutch a rope at each end and hold tight. Hold out when you are ready. He and Mary then each took the end of a rope and passed it round the tree, the two trees being not quite so far apart as the length of the mat. Tommy gave the word. They began to haul. The trees relieved them of all strength and making a succession of short pools with rest in between. They drew the cradle inch by inch to the surface. Elizabeth was afraid that Mary's strength might give way, or that Tommy would lose grip of the rope. But neither of these mishap talker, and with a pineal pool they pulled out Tommy and Cradle over the brink of the pit. And then overwrought nerves gave way. Elizabeth ran to Tommy, clasped her in her arms, and burst into tears. A little later, when all three girls were sitting together, wimping in sympathy, Elizabeth exclaimed, Well, we are a lot of babies. We ought to be shouting for joy. I'm quite ashamed of myself. I'm not, said Mary stoutly. I think it's a blessing we can cry a little. It eases the nerves. Boys never cry. And what's the result? They get as crappy as two sticks. How am I to get you two poor invalids home, said Elizabeth. You had done wonders, Mary. But you'll be utterly done up if you tried to walk back. And Tommy certainly can't walk back. 
We shall have to stay here for the night. Fortunately, it is fine. Oh no, we must get home, Miss, said Tommy earnestly. I could not bear to stay here after seeing that face. But there can't be anything to harm us, persisted Elizabeth. I have walked round and round, miles all together, and haven't seen a single sign of people. You are quite sure it was a human face? Mayn't it have been a monkey or an owl? No, I'm sure of it. You never saw such eyes. They seem to burn like fire. But didn't you see the body too? No, just a face. That was what frightened me so. Just a face that seemed dull eyes. Elizabeth saw that Tommy had been too much scared to take real notice of anything. I did that for a sake of peace of mind, it would be better to make an attempt to reach home. Very well then, it's a case of pick your back. I'll carry you. Mary must get the law as well as she can. It'll take an age, but we can rest on the way. They started. Mary carrying Elizabeth's mat, and Elizabeth carrying Tommy. Slowly and with many halts, they made their way down, reaching the hut about their usual tea time. The two elder girls had taken precaution to fill their pockets with fruit as they skirted the orange grove. They had no other fruit in the hut except coconut, and Elizabeth was too worn out to think of catching fish. They satisfied themselves with a meal of fruit. Tommy was delighted with the behaviour of her parent Billy, overjoyed at the return of his mistress. Up upon her shoulder, and, and uttering cries loud but by no means sweet. Welcome home, Tommy, said Elizabeth, smiling. We can't gush, Mary and I, but we are more glad than we can say, dear, and Billy says it for us as well as he can. Then, after Tommy's ankle had been bathed and bound up, they threw themselves on their simple couches, and all their present anxiety set at rest, slept heavily until the sun woke them to another day. Luckily for Tommy that her sisters found her after all. Otherwise it could have gone tragically. Tune in next week to see what happens next.